We're charged with trying to make recommendations to make the country safer. Uh, would each of you have one recommendation that uh, we should pursue, uh, that we could make in our report, which, since you're out there in the field really doing the work, probably know better than anybody else, what could we recommend that would make your job easier and America safer? Uh, since you asked, I, I was going to bite my tongue, but uh, <laughs> I would strongly urge you, you to think very, very long and hard before you think about the MI5 option. And my concern is if you create another division in government, uh, I'd be worried about tearing down a wall and then digging a moat. Um, because if there's a wall is gone that the FBI can share information, but then the information is now put in a different agency, people have to decide what's intelligence versus what's evidence when it's information. I'd be very concerned that we would think we're making things better, but we'd actually be making things worse and putting it back to the way it was. Okay, that's the recommendation you don't want us to make. What recommendation <laughs> would you like us to make? <laughs> or anybody. Sure. Um, drawing on the idea presented by Senator Kerry, or touched on, um, that it might be uh, do well to consider the intelligence community as an integrated body uh, of a number of different agencies, and then in times of crisis or times of need for information, to consider the experts in those organizations regardless of where they come from, go to your best source. Okay. Well, Dr. Kay? Um, the, the, only, the only recommendation um, that I would make is one which, um, and purely parochial interest here, but it's, uh, it's one where we continue to strengthen our intelligence agencies to enable them to do the job that um, they are supposed to do, uh, both uh, from an analytical perspective in terms of the CIA as well as an operational perspective that we have enough people and enough resources. I think that's what we need. Beginning in May of 2001, each of the four pilot hijackers flew across the United States. As FBI Director Mueller described these trips, quote, with their training complete, it appears that the pilots began conducting possible surveillance flights as passengers aboard cross-country flights transiting between the Northeast United States and California, end quote. On May 24th, Marwan al-Shehi flew from New York to San Francisco in a Boeing 67, 767 seated in first class, leaving immediately on a Boeing 757 seated in first class to Las Vegas. On May 27th, Marwan al-Shehi left Las Vegas to San Francisco, continuing to New York, on a Boeing 767 seated in first class. On June 7th, Ziad Jarrah flew from Baltimore via Los Angeles to Las Vegas, returning to Baltimore on June 10th. On June 28th, Muhammad Atta flew from Boston to San Francisco, continuing to Las Vegas, departing there on July 1st through Denver to Boston. On August 31st, on August 13th, Muhammad Atta flew from a second time across country from Washington to Las Vegas on a Boeing 757 seated in first class, returning on August 14th to Fort Lauderdale. On August 13th, Pani Hanjur and Nawap Al Hazmi, seated in first class, flew from Dulles to Las Vegas via Los Angeles. They left Las Vegas on August 14th on a flight to Minneapolis, close to Egan, Minnesota, where Zacharias Musawi had started flight lessons the day before, connecting an hour and a half later, to a flight to Baltimore. Director Robert Mueller of the FBI noted the Las Vegas layovers. Quote, Each of the return flights for these hijackers had layovers in Las Vegas. To date, the purpose of these one- to two-day layovers is not known. However, with respect to travel to Las Vegas, we know that at least one hijacker on each of the four hijacked airplanes traveled to Las Vegas, Nevada, sometime between May and August of 2001. This travel consisted of an initial transcontinental trip from an East Coast city to a West Coast city and a connection in that West Coast city to a Las Vegas-bound flight, end quote. Muhammad Atta flew to Zurich from Miami in July 2001, continuing on to Madrid, Spain. He checked out of a Madrid hotel on July 9th and rented a car that he returned on July 19th after having driven 1,908 kilometers. For the days immediately following July 9th, 
Muhammad Atta's whereabouts are unknown until he checked into a hotel in Tarragona on Spain's east coast on July 16th. On July 9th, Ramzi bin al Sheib flew from Hamburg to Tarragona, where he checked out of a hotel on July 10th. His whereabouts from July 10th to the 16th are unaccounted for, roughly the same period during which Muhammad Atta's movements are unknown, suggesting, according to DCI tenant, that the two engaged in clandestine meetings on the progress of the plot. Muhammad Atta returned to the United States on July 19th, arriving in Atlanta. Ziad Jarrah traveled to Germany from Newark on July 25th, returning on August 5th, a trip that may have been permitted further contact with Ramsey bin al-Sheib. Director Robert Mueller also testified that during the summer of 2001, some of the hijackers, specifically Muhammad Atta and Awaf al-Hazmi, appeared to have face-to-face -face meetings on a monthly basis to discuss the status of the operation and ultimately the final preparation for the attack. In an interview with Al Jazeera shortly before his capture, Ramzi bin al Sheib told Yoshri Fruda that he described Nawab al Hazmi as Muhammad Atta's right hand. As the supporting hijackers arrived, they divided between Florida and New York before moving to three staging areas. The two who arrived in Virginia and the two who arrived in New York joined Nawab al Hazmi and Hani Hanjur in Patterson, New Jersey. The four who arrived in Orlando and the five who arrived in Miami joined Muhammad Atta, Marwan al Shehi, and Ziad Jarrah in the Fort Lauderdale, Florida area. The 19 hijackers began to book September 11 flights on August 26th. Khalid al Midor and Majid Makid, hijackers on the Pentagon flight, were unable to buy tickets on August 24th because their address could not be verified. They finally purchased them with cash on September 5th at the American Airlines counter in the Baltimore Washington International Airport. The hijackers in the Fort Lauderdale area also booked flights to locations in the Boston, Newark, New Jersey, and Washington DC areas where the teams for each September 11th flight assembled. 